Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Laura Plummer, and I am the statewide assistive technology program coordinator for Department of Health Services for Wisconsin. And happy to see everyone who has joined today for our ethical considerations in smart home provision. So this training is sponsored by WISTEC, which is Wisconsin's Assistive Technology Act program and the Department of Health Services. Um, it is free to you today. And we will be providing CRC credits for certified rehabilitation counselors and CEU credits. And more information on this is available in the survey that you will get following this webinar. And those certificates are sent out within 30 days of the end of this webinar. So a little bit of housekeeping. We do have captioning. And if you need to access that, you can use the three dots or the CC button at the bottom of your screen. We have sign language interpreting. And we will be using the Q&A for questions. Our chat is apparently not functioning today. So I will continue to work on that from the back end while we are learning about ethical considerations of smart home provision. Um, there will be a survey that pops up at the end of this webinar. And then it will also come out in an email to you tomorrow. And we do look forward to getting your feedback on the training. And that is also where you will indicate if you are in need of CRC or CEU credits. The webinar is archived and will be on the WISTEC YouTube channel, usually within about a month. And a link to the handouts will also be included in the survey. So I will go ahead and introduce um, Tony Gentry. He is coming to us today from the Virginia Commonwealth University and is going to share all of his wealth of information on the ethical considerations of smart home provision. And I will let him share a little bit more about his background, um, but we are excited to welcome you virtually to Wisconsin today and look forward to learning from you. So go Thank ahead, Tony. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, everyone that's joined in on the call today. Yeah, I'm Tony Gentry, and I'm an occupational therapy professor. I'm calling, I'm calling you in this um, morning from Richmond, Virginia, in my study at home. So uh, I'm, I'm nice and comfy, and I hope you all have a cup of coffee and you're in a comfy seat as well. Uh, this is a topic that um, smart home provision is a topic that I've been working on for about as long as there are, have been smart homes. Um, it's as you know, if you watched, if you have seen any advertising online or on TV over the last five years, uh, this is a really burgeoning area of technology, consumer technology. Um, but for people with disabilities, it, these uh, tools are not just conveniences, they are also, they can be life-changing supports. So we're all starting to use them more, we're all starting to have questions coming to us from our clients about them, and we're beginning to think about the ethical issues involved in monitoring people at home, in providing supports that are um, sometimes difficult to use or understand, and all sorts of other things around information security and privacy that come into play uh, with smart home provision. Fortunately for all of us in caregiving professions, there are ethical guidelines that we are led to follow, that we are asked to follow, that we are required to follow to uh, provide the supports that we do provide to our clients. And that's really what I wanna talk about today. Um, ethical considerations and how they apply to this new field called smart home provision. By the way, if you'd like to reach out to me after the talk, my email address is at the bottom of this slide. Um, I'll read it out to you. L-O-G-E-N-T-R-Y at V-C-U dot E-D-U. 
the approach I'm taking in, in, to this topic is as follows. The plan, and I'll read this out to you, this is what you read when you applied to take the, uh, the lecture, uh, is at the conclusion of this presentation, attendees will be able to describe key features and capabilities of smart home technologies that may impact personal efficacy, safety, and privacy, Describe how the CRC Code of Ethics applies to the provision of smart home technologies. Apply informed ethical reasoning to smart home provision for people with disabilities. And apply informed advocacy towards ethical standards for smart home provision for people with disabilities. Laura has asked me to follow the CRC Code of Ethics in this talk this morning. I'm an occupational therapist who follows um, the OT Code of Ethics. Um, as you'll see, I'm going to show a slide in just a moment. Whatever healthcare profession or whatever caregiving profession you're a part of, um, that profession has its own Code of Ethics, and really they're all talking about the same things. The map I'm going to follow over the next two hours, um, we're going to first talk about the law and its, and its ethics, the similarities and differences between those two things, the core principles and sections of the CRC code, and this sticky question of ethical dilemmas around the affordances and features of smart homes. We're going to look at the ethical concerns in supporting people in their homes and providing home modification. Uh, and then the special ethical concerns around smart home provision. Finally, we're going to look at suggestions for resolving smart home related um, ethical considerations. If you have a question um, as we go along, uh, please type it into the Q&A box. As Laura said, it looks like the chat box may have been disabled this morning. From time to time during this talk, I'm going to pause to check the Q&A box um, to, to, and respond to questions that you may have posted. If, if for some reason, reason there's a uh, technical glitch, Laura's going to be monitoring the Q&A box. So post it there and she'll interrupt so that we can fix that. Um, and then during the problem solving uh, situation towards the end of this um, lecture, uh, we'll again use the Q&A box to post your own answers to questions that I'll be posing. Okay, so you've got your cup of coffee, you've got your comfy seat. Let's begin. The law is a collection of rules and regulations by which society is governed. These are not given down from above. These are man-made rules that regulate our conduct in a formal and binding manner. Supposedly, our laws reflect society's needs, attitudes, and mores. They're not fixed in place. They can be changed. Um, they are a blending of court decisions, state and federal statutes, regulations, and procedures. The fundamental guiding legal principles in health practice, whenever someone can claim to be harmed by something you may have done or not done, is called the reasonably prudent man principle. I'm going to show you that in just a moment. I want to talk for a minute about where that comes into play around this issue of a legal dilemma. A legal dilemma is one in which a full and equitable solution does not appear to be possible. When no scientifically right or wrong answer can be provided and both sides seem to have a good argument. The way that's resolved typically in a courtroom is through the discussion of different points of view, examining precedents, and all sorts of arguments such as what the implications of this next ruling might be. The reasonably prudent man principle means is the fundamental guiding legal principle in healthcare practice. And what it means is, it's the standard that requires a person to perform your function in a way that any reasonable person of ordinary prudence with a comparable education, skills, and training under similar circumstances would perform that same function. The judge tries to figure out <clears throat> if what you did 
is, a, is what a reasonably prudent person would do in the same situation. That's a person of ordinary sense, following ordinary care with ordinary skill. It's a simple concept to grasp, but in practice, it can get a little difficult to carry out. Every case is different. I want to give you an example from my occupational therapy uh, experience. I was called on a few years ago as a witness in a trial where a stroke patient in a hospital had fallen while taking a shower under the supervision of an occupational therapy student. The student knew that the patient had unstable dynamic seated balance so that when seated in, seating in a chair, if he tried to move, he might lose his balance. He was on a shower seat in the shower and she stepped away for a moment to grab a towel. Of course, that's the moment he fell, hit his head and had a brain injury on top of his stroke. The court decision turned on what a reasonably prudent therapist in that situation would have done. And as you might imagine, it was decided that this person would have stayed with the patient and used the call bell, which is in the, which is in the um, bathroom of every hospital room, call a nurse and get that person to bring a towel while, while standing with the person who may, who may fall. In this case, not only was the student found liable for the injury, but so was her supervising OT and the hospital itself. That's an important thing to keep in mind because you can be held legally liable for the mistakes of the people you are supervising. In that court case, as in most legal dilemmas involving injury in a healthcare setting, these are the items that the court took in, into consideration. Custom and usage in the community, the accreditation requirements of the hospital, hospital and facility policies, the state licensing standards for occupational therapy, and the job descriptions for this particular person. So keep in mind, in your practice, you are legally bound and responsible uh, for your professional practice under professional liability standards. And it is not just malpractice that can get you into trouble, actively making a mistake. It's also neglecting to do something that you should have done. Keep in mind there are two sets of laws, criminal and civil. Professional liability cases are civil matters. In civil law, everyone in society has the duty to exercise due care for his or her own safety and the safety of others. Failing to do that is called negligence. Negligence that ends up hurting someone can end up in a civil suit or a lawsuit. A caregiving professional is required to comply with what is called the standard of care. That's following what I mentioned before, the reasonably prudent man principle. Certain explicit or implied rules of conduct are involved, and failure to follow these standards is a departure from the standard of care, and they constitute the, the legal term negligence. To prove negligence, it's the plaintiff, the person who was injured, who has the burden of proof. In the case of the OT student, these three burdens of proof were deemed met by the jury. They are a breach of duty, there was a deviation from the accepted standard of care, there was causation, it was that breach of duty that caused the injury, and the person was in fact injured. There were damages. And as I said, there was also a vicarious liability shared by the student's OT supervisor and the hospital itself. Keep in mind, as I said, that the liability can be shared with another practitioner. That's that vicarious thing I just mentioned, where you're held liable for someone else's actions. Here are some types of situations that a rehab counselor might find themselves in civil court for. 
ill-advised counseling that leads to an injury, premature discharge from care, again, that leads to an injury, use of an unproven technique beyond the standard of care, failure to keep accurate records, again, that can be shown to lead to an injury, treatment outside your professional scope of practice, and any injury caused by staff under your supervision. Think for a moment of another situation that where you as a rehab counselor or if you're in another profession uh, attending today might be held liable um, in, a, in a civil action following the, the uh, prudent man uh, model. And you're, you're welcome to post that on the Q&A box if you want to. Here in Virginia, the um, licensing body for all of the all medical professions posts a newsletter every quarter. And in that newsletter, people who are being sanctioned for uh, legal problems um, are listed in, in, as, as, a, as an effort to sort of shame them around the thing that they've done. And the claim that is most often listed is developing a personal relationship with the person, with your client. Um, it's just, so this is one of those things I haven't brought up, but, but does come into play sometimes. Let me just check the Q&A real quick. And uh, Cindy Pitchler has written, the failure to properly train a user on how to properly use a piece of AT is also a place where you might be legally challenged. Thank you so much, Cindy. That's a very good answer and applies to what we're talking about today. And this is Laura. I believe yeah. chat should be fixed if someone wants to give it a test. Oh, great. So chat's up and running now? Should be. Great. Thank you. So you can use, uh, you can use chat now. <clears throat> There, there are enforcement procedures that are followed um, when someone is, is being legally challenged for their behavior as a, as a clinician. Um, and this is the model that's followed under licensure enforcement. Any complaint goes to the state's enforcement division. Um, the case is closed if it's turned out that it's an unfounded claim. Um, a consent order may be, may be ordered where the licensee agrees to abide by the law going forward. A reprimand or a censure may be uh, required. There may be a monetary penalty. Um, you may also be required to, to do some kind of corrective action or a medial uh, educational plan. Um, you may be put on probation for a period of time. Your practice privileges may be limited for a period of time. Your license may be suspended or revoked. And if it's determined that a, that a law has been broken, you may be referred to a criminal court as well. So the ethical side of our practice. And let's talk just for a minute about the background of what really, what really is ethics. Ethics is a careful and systematic study of the nature of morality. So we're talking about morality here, a study of what's right and what's wrong. Morality is a set of guidelines and standards that are striven for as ideals that are intended to protect our basic human values. Our values give direction to the human community and become our moral Keep in mind, too, that a behavior may be considered unethical without being, without being illegal. When we think about the behavior of ourselves and others from the standpoint of morality or ethics, we judge conduct, things that we think are right or wrong behaviors, character traits that we feel are good or bad, and motives that are praiseworthy or blameworthy. We might call someone a hero, for instance, or we might call someone a coward. 
without getting too deeply down in the weeds here, um, there are two major theories that we typically follow when we're arguing out ethical problems, the teleological and the deontological models. The teleological model looks at the consequences of an action to determine if they're good or bad. That theory is based on values whose relative worth is determined based on the end justifying the means. The deontological model looks at morality and ethics differently. They say that some things are simply wrong and some things are simply right, no matter what the outcome may be. That's based on your own moral obligation or duty. This sounds a little squirrely to talk about, but a, a very simple way to understand it as an example, probably the most horrific example, but clear example I can think of, was the decision by President Truman during World War II to drop atomic bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. He clearly followed the end justifies the means teleological model in making that decision. His argument being, this will end the war, let's do it. But I'm sure that there were people arguing from the other side, the deontological model to him saying, dropping bombs on civilian cities is wrong no matter what you do, no matter what the outcome may be. Um, in his case, we, we know the outcome of what, of what was decided. Um, there are, this is the nature of ethical decisions. We um, have, to, have to argue them one side or the other and make a decision one way or the other, uh, whatever the consequences may be. The CRC Code of Ethics fortunately provides support in helping us figure out how to decide these kinds of issues. And the code of ethics for the CRC, like the code of ethics that I follow as an occupational therapist, is quite thoroughly laid out for you to support you in thinking through all the different situations you may find yourself in. Um, it's posted online at the link shown that I'm going to show you below at the bottom of this slide. Um, and there are six ethical principles that it follows. There are 12 standards. Um, they apply to all rehab counseling personnel at all levels. Um, and they pertain to any action in violation of the spirit and purpose of the code. Um, and that violation may be considered unethical. The Commission on Rehab Counselor Certification establishes and maintains those enforcement procedures. And this is the code of ethics online that you're welcome to pull up and take a look at. Um, as I said before, it's quite thorough and is a great support for helping you think through uh, questions that you may run across in your practice. There are six principles that are followed by uh, rehab counselors. They are autonomy, which is the respecting the rights of clients to be self-governing within your social and cultural framework. Beneficence doing good to others, promoting the well-being of your clients. Fidelity, to be faithful, to keep your promises and honor the trust that, you're, that is placed in you as a rehab counselor. Justice, to be fair in the treatment of your clients and to provide appropriate services for all. Non-maleficence, to do no harm. And veracity, to be honest. These, these are the six principles that uh, certified rehab counselors are expected to follow. But as I said before, each, each healthcare profession has its own code of ethics. And as you can see from this next slide, I'm comparing the rehab counseling code of ethics in the box on the left, the occupational therapy code of ethics to the box on the right. We use a different set of, of um, words for our principles, but I've drawn arrows to show that if you were to read the definitions of each of these principles, you'd see that really we're talking about the same ideas. There are all also enforceable standards of ethical practice that are, that are uh, clarified quite clearly in the code. I'm just going to, there are 12 of them followed by the CRC uh, involving the counseling relationship, confidentiality, privileged communication and privacy, 
advocacy and accessibility, professional responsibility, your relationships with other professionals and employers, forensic services, assessment and evaluation, supervision, training and teaching, research and publication, technology, social media and distance counseling, business practices and the resolution of ethical issues. As with legal um, violations, there is an enforcement code in the Code of Ethics as well, and the guidelines for complaints I've again linked in blue at the bottom of this slide. Um, th these are the steps that might be followed if a complaint is uh, lodged against you. You may receive a letter of instruction um, with, that may include provisional suspension of your license. You may be reprimanded, um, and there may be remedial requirements specified. You may be put on probation, and your certification may be suspended. It's also possible that your certification may be revoked with an, with an option to reapply in 18 months. So those are, those are the standard uh, things that, we've, that you follow as a rehab counselor, very similar to what I follow as an occupational therapist. And the code lays out for you very good guidelines for how, how to think through ethical considerations in your practice. However, there are difficulties that arise. There, as there are legal dilemmas, there are also ethical dilemmas. And these are situations that are much harder to tease out and come up with an answer with the, um, than may be shown by, in the code. Ethical dilemmas are, are unmistakable, <clears throat> excuse me, tensions around needing to decide the right thing to do. The answer is not going to be obvious, and there may be less than satisfactory alternatives. We're often faced in our practice with difficult situations involving ethical principles where we can't clearly see how we should or should not respond. The, these are not ethical dilemmas. An ethical dilemma, however, as difficult as it may be to resolve, there are guidelines provided again by the CRC. And again, I've, give, I've given you a link to the website that discusses them at the bottom of this slide. There's a procedure that we all try to follow when we can't make up our mind around which way to go around an ethical problem. Um, this procedure we're gonna be following when we get to the questions towards the end of, of our lecture today. The first thing to think about is, do you, do you know that there is an ethical dilemma? Do you smell something fishy in the, in the decision that's being made? <coughs> Excuse me. Once you've done that, you work with your client. Excuse me. To define the problem, typically in one sentence. Having defined the problem, you and your client work together to figure out what solutions might be available to work through the problem and solve it. You and your client choose one of those solutions. But before you implement it, you think about it for a moment and go, wait a minute, let's take one more look at the thinking involved in coming to this solution. Let's make sure this is where we want to go. Once you've made that decision, you and your client implement that solution. See if it works, see if it makes sense, see if it's doing what you hoped it would do, if the result is the consequence you were looking for. If it's not, you can go back and choose another solution and start over again. And, on, and as you're going through implementing this solution, you're going to continue to reflect on and review the decision that you were made. This is a very thoughtful, collaborative model for solving uh, these kinds of dilemmas. And again, that decision-making model is teased out in more detail in the link that I put at the bottom of this slide. So the, the question that comes up a lot of times is, well, how do I smell that something's wrong? How do I get a sense that something's not right here? And a model that is good to follow is this is, is called the ethical yardstick. 
And what that means is you ask yourself, what difference would it make if everyone knew about this decision that I'm making? What would happen if your family members and your friends knew what you've done or what you plan to do? The chances are that any decision you make in the hope that no one will find out is not really an ethical decision. So that was a brief review of ethics and caregiving. Um, I'm just going to check the chat box for a minute to see if there are any questions that have popped up so far. This is Laura. I haven't seen any, and I did share your the two links in the chat. So people oh, terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. All you right. <clears throat> so Let's think about these ethical concerns in the context of a growing area of practice that has lots of thorny questions around, the, around ethics to tangle with. That's the issue of home modification and smart home provision. Whether you live in a teepee, an igloo, or, or a little red, red cottage, uh, wherever you hang your hat, home is a very personal and a deeply meaningful concept to all of us. And when you set about discussing changes to a person's home, even where you hope to improve safety or improve function, you can expect questions and pushback, sometimes outright resistance. And that's because of the very personal, emotional connection we have with the places we live. By definition, here's an, a definition, a home might be considered a dwelling place together with the family or social unit that occupies it, a household. Another definition, home is a safe haven and a comfort zone, a place to live with our families and pets and enjoy with friends, a place to build memories, a place where we can truly just be ourselves. In, in our practice, another way to think of homes might be as an assistive technology. They're the box that protects us from the weather, the, the, the box that keeps us safe, and they're the box within which we set up a whole set of technologies to help us live our life more fully. Because we th we're thinking of, of homes as assistive technologies and modifications to homes um, as assistive technology, there are also ethical codes in place whenever you're thinking about modifying a home. RESNO, which is the Rehabilitation in, um, Engineering and Assistive Technology Society of North America, offers an ATP certification for anyone who, who wishes to practice assistive technology provision and they have their own code of ethics. Again, I put a link there to their code of ethics, which will look very similar to the code of ethics that each of you is following in your own profession. Those of you who wish to really get into home modification can pursue an ATP certification or any of the many home modification certificates that are offered along with training programs on the market. OTs um, can, can receive a badge in home modification. There's an aging in place specialist certification by, called CAPS. There's a certified environmental access consultant certification um, with, the, with the initial SEAC. And there's also an executive certificate in home modification offered by the University of Southern California. Um, you can Google any of those to see how to go about acquiring them. And again, each one of them includes a code of ethics around providing these kinds of supports for people in their home. So let's look for a minute at, the, at this issue of smart homes. That's the newest thing in home modification and design, and we've all been talking about them for a long time. Um, very likely your clients are interested in these assistive technologies because whether you have <clears throat> an impairment related to mobility or cognition or sensory loss, smart home tech can make your life at home safer and easier. And any tool that works that way at home or on the job site 
is worth considering. But when I think of smart homes, I like to take a step back and consider what we're really talking about. By my, to, by my way of thinking, anything, any home that is designed for access, security, comfort, and livability may be considered a smart home, whether it has a whole lot of high-tech features or not. Homes that have ease of use features, that support functional independence, and that are individualized to each person's needs and interests might be considered a smart home. Smart home features are becoming increasingly available and affordable and increasingly advertised almost everywhere you go. <clears throat> Most of my research career has focused on leveraging mobile technology, your phones and tablets, and all the ways that there are many apps uh, can support people with disabilities. I like to say when we think about portable computer, computers and smartphones um, that their convenience is for most of us, but for people with disabilities, they can be life-changing assistive technologies. The same is true for smart homes. Many of us enjoy having smart home technologies, but people who really need them might be people with mobility limitations, uh, people who are hard of hearing, people who are blind or vision impaired, uh, people with attention, memory, or other cognitive problems, people with medical care needs, people who are transitioning from supported living to independent living, anyone who is an emerging risk of nursing home placement, and really any other person who may be motivated to increase their functional independence through the use of assistive technology. As I see it, any tool that supports safety and function at home is a smart home device, which can include low-tech and, and mid-tech tools. Smart homes can improve safety and security. They can assist with mobility, transfers, and access. They can automate routine appliance functions, allow remote control of home features using a variety of access tools and supports. They can provide communication tools, including passive occupant monitoring. And as we've all been learning during the COVID epidemic, they can assist with task support, shopping, bill paying, and social interaction, typically through your computer. In the low tech and mid tech world, lots of different kinds of tools are available. And I'm just gonna um, throw up a few um, examples. There are six pictures on this slide, um, and I'm just going to mention each, each of them one by one. Um, for people with mobility impairments, these are important features. Um, there are grab bars in a bathroom, including a long-handled handle on a toilet. The second picture shows a tub with a tub bench, a long-handled hose, and a grab bar. The third picture shows a device called a hydraulic chairlift, which can raise and lower a person into a tub. On the bottom left is a ramp that allows a wheelchair to get in and out of a house from the street. In the center at the bottom is a Hoyer lift attached to the person to get in and out of bed, on and off the toilet, in and out of a wheelchair, either on their own or with the support of a caregiver as shown here. And finally, on the right, more and more of my clients are using um, automatic bidets in their toilets. Um, the one shown here is a Neo 120 that can be added to any toilet to help with toilet hygiene. I'm always thinking about safety when I go in to visit someone's home and think about home modifications. And these are some safety features that really all of us could use, but that, that really come into play for folks who have uh, cognitive impairments and mobility impairments. Um, I'm gonna walk through these, these slides one by one as well, these pictures one by one as well. On the upper left, there is a motion controlled light switch. I'm a big fan of using those, especially on stairways where people may fall. In the middle at the top is a device called a cook stop. Um, 
This is, is an important electric eye that can be hung near a stove in a kitchen. And the idea behind a cook stop is that if you walk out of your kitchen after you've turned your stove on and don't come back in a certain period of time, that device will set off an alarm to call you back into the kitchen. And if you don't come back, it'll turn your stove off. It saves you from a house fire. Um, most of us are familiar with um, coffee makers that turn themselves off for the same reason. At the bottom left, I, there's a little device called a water bug. Um, this is one of the many devices on the market that can sense a water leak and set off an alarm when there is one. Next to that is a plug is a plug in flashlight and night light automatic or, or it typically operates simply as a night light. But if the power goes off in your home, the battery in that night light switches the light on, it then becomes a flashlight so you can find your way around in the dark. Many people with mobility impairments and cognitive impairments have, and, and really all of us really, have difficulty using fire extinguishers because they're unwieldy, heavy, and you're in a panic mode when you need to use them. There are aerosol fire extinguishers that work very simply and very well. Right at the bottom um, is a, an unusual kind of smoke alarm. It's called a KidSmart. Uh, for people who are cognitively impaired, and again, for pediatric populations, these are can be really helpful uh, kinds of smoke alarms. Rather than going screaming, screaming at you uh, with a fire alarm when they sniff smoke, what they do instead is recite back to you a tape-recorded message telling you what to do when the fire, when the, when it, when a smoke is sensed, the argument behind a kid smart, uh, which is kind of um, wonderful when you think about it, there's been that ch um, that children very often will sleep through the sound of an alarm, but they will awaken at the sound of their mother's voice. So we ask the mom to be the person who records this tape recorded message that again is read out loud by the device when it senses smoke. So those are some low tech and mid tech devices that I typically recommend to people when I'm uh, considering home modifications. And I consider all of those smart home tools. But most of the time when we say smart home, we mean automated or remote controlled electronics. The picture shown here is a diagram of a home where many of its electronic components, especially its entertainment and um, home uh, temperature controls are controlled by remote controls or some kind of automated switch. This is where the most challenging ethical dilemmas occur around smart home technologies. So the things that can be automated or, or controlled remotely include lights and lamps, uh, media equipment, entertainment equipment to your TV, your radio, a camera, your stereo really any appliance that has an on and off switch, like a fan, motorized doors, window shades, your door locks, your thermostat, your phone and your computer, and these, this thing that you may or may not be using called occupant monitors. And what's miraculous to an old hand who's been doing this for a long time is that nowadays, almost anyone can access and control all of their home electronics, no matter what their mobility um, impairment may be. Um, if you can, these people through the, the power of switches can control their computer and through their computer control their home environment. I wanna just look, go through this on this slide just for a moment. There are a number of switches shown here. I'm gonna speak, talk about each one, one by one. The first I want to talk about, I'm going to blink on that, is just a red button switch. If, if your mobility is such that you need to, you can only control a device by tapping a switch, you can control your computer that way and control your home that way. You can also control one using, a, using an, an unconnected Bluetooth switch, like the Bluetooth switch shown here. If you are otherwise paralyzed, but have the ability to sip and puff with your mouth, you can also control your computer and your smart home. 
If you can only turn your head from side to side, you can control a mouse with a mouse with a head control camera um, in the same way. And people who do not even have that capability, but who have the, the ability to open, close, and move their eyes, can now control their computer and their smart home with an eye gaze device. Of course, um, if you are able to speak clearly, um, you can use any of the many voice assistants on the market to control your home environment as well. That's all because of switches. <clears throat> So many people who would otherwise need personal assistance now can try to live on their own or with only occasional care visits. These people can also work from home. And thanks to the efforts of rehab counselors and others, they can utilize these same supports in the workplace. This is really wonderful. But along with automated and remote controls, have emerged an array of tools that allow an off-site caregiver to monitor what goes on in the home or in the workplace, which raises, as you might imagine, both opportunities and red flags. In the early days, uh, let's go back 20 years when I first started thinking about smart home technologies, we attempted to use video cameras to watch grandma at home and make sure that she didn't fall and that she took her medications on schedule. As you might imagine, grandma wasn't having it. So over time, tools that we call passive monitors have come into play um, and they are considered more palatable, if in some ways no less intrusive. A couple of the national vendors who provide passive monitoring options are quiet care by a company called Care Innovations and Grand Care. I'm not, I didn't put their, their links up, but you can easily Google them if you're interested. The model that these two companies follow is that you call them up and you set up an appointment and then a vendor comes to your home, talks about what your needs may be around offsite supervision, are you afraid of falling? Are you afraid of not taking your medications? Do you need someone to, to come in and make sure that you're safe in the kitchen? Um, those kinds of things are considered and talked about. And then they go about your home setting up passive monitors um, to keep track of you during the day. There might be a monitor that um, set under the mattress in your bed to, that notifies a caregiver when you've gotten in or out of bed. There may be one um, on your pillbox that shows when you've picked up your pillbox and used it. There may be one at your front door that shows when your front door is open and closed to tell it when, you've op when you may have left the home or come back to it. Um, there may be motion control sensors in different rooms of your house to track when you go in and out of those rooms during the day. And the idea behind all of this is to let you go on about your business, just living your life while these sensors are being switched on and off and that information sent to an off-site server that's tracking that you are indeed up and around doing the things you typically do during the day. If that's not happening, then you, you get a phone call or a message sent through, in the case of Grand Care, your set-top TV saying, is everything okay? Or are you doing all right? If you, you can respond, yes, it's okay. I just Got, I just got out of bed later this morning than I wanted to otherwise. Um, everything's fine. If you don't respond, then 911 or another emergency responder may be called. That's how these passive monitor systems work. Well, as you might imagine, uh, many of us have found ways to manage these kinds of passive monitoring situations without the use of a monthly fee based vendor. Um, these are, uh, I've the devices that are available off the shelf at Home Depot that you can go get and set up your own passive home monitoring system at home. On the upper left is the Philips Hue motion sensor that could be Velcroed to a wall and track motion coming in and out of a room. On the bottom is a Samsung SmartThings arrival sensor. I'm sorry, this, the Philips Hue sensor is about $35. The smart things arrival sensor is about $16 that can be attached to a, a backpack um, in a glove compartment of a car, for instance, to track when that sensor moves away from the home and comes back closer to the home again. 
Um, there can also be a home kit door sensor attached to a front or back back door to track when that door is open and closed. That costs a little under $30. All of that information um, it can be connected to a smartphone app so that the off-site caregiver can track when any of these are triggered. Um, and, and these sensors can be set up as, and you, you use your own cleverness, your own creativity in deciding where in a particular home you'd want to set these kinds of things up. Motion sensors might be set up in the living spaces. There's a picture here showing two motion sensors that sort of cross the living room space of a particular home so that whenever that person moves from the kitchen into the living room, um, a, a, a reminder is triggered. You might set one up in the garage door. Uh, arrival sensors can be set on a key ring, on a vehicle or bicycle, in a backpack. You might set up doorway sensors at the front and back doors, but you might also get creative and put one on a bathroom door, the medicine cabinet, or the refrigerator to get a better sense of how someone's moving through the house during the day. And the really wonderful, um, if, when you're thinking about this from a tracking perspective, um, thing about these things is all that information gets sent to the app on the caregiver's cell phone who's away from home. Um, you can set them up to operate in certain in different ways. One way would be to receive a text every single time a sensor gets activated. That's going to be a lot of text all day long and it's going to be overwhelming. So what you can also do is set up routines so as a caregiver you're only notified if a variance occurs in the triggering of these devices. For instance, let's say there's a bathroom door sensor. At 8.30 in the morning, between 8.30 and 9 every morning, grandma, let's say, gets up and goes in the bathroom. That door gets open and closed. And a half an hour later, more or less, she, the door is opened again and closed again as she comes out. If something happens, let's say a half an hour earlier or later than that, that's when you get a notification and you might call and say, are you OK? Um, and just ask to make sure everything's going all right. At any time on these apps, you can check to see the status of the sensors and the apps are going to store all the sensor activity in a database so you can track them over time to improve the accuracy of the routines that you're tracking. Um, this is exactly what those monthly pay vendors do. In this case, you're taking control of all that, um, much less expensively, um, and it's all being driven through your through an app on your phone to track the on-site person that you're tracking. I want to talk a little bit more about some um, more ways that this is being done um, the, the, or just in the last year or so, some new strategies have come into play. Amazon, as you might imagine, is getting into this business. So for anyone who has an Alexa voice assistant, any of the Echo devices or the show devices, for instance, um, you can sign on to a free system called the Alexa Care Hub. So in this case, the person who's being monitored has, let's say, an Amazon Echo on their kitchen counter. And the caregiver who's off-site uh, downloads the Alexa Care Hub app onto their phone and connects that to the voice assistant in their loved one's home. Anytime the voice assistant is triggered at the home, let's say grandma says, what, what, what's the weather tomorrow going to be? The app on the cell phone gets a notification that, that, tr that has been triggered. Um, so this is one way of making sure that grandma's up and around doing what she do, doing what she typically does during the day, but you're only in this case tracking her interactions with the Alexa device. Um, and Tony, this is Laura. Yes. yes. I just wanted to share an update for folks. Um, Care yeah. Hub has essentially been discontinued, and it is now a paid service through Alexa together. So um, I had utilized Care Hub with my mom until um, early summer when it it switched over to Alexa together. So Thank you. Thank they have you, made some updates on that. It's not, it was great when it worked, um, but she was not in a place where we really needed it anymore. So I did not elect to go with the subscription for it. So do, do, do you know how much the subscription is? Is Not without looking. Um, okay. 
I had been invited to like a six month trial, you know, because right. we were existing hub users. And again, I didn't pursue it, but okay. it would be right on their website. Okay. Just thank thank you so much. Okay. Thank yeah. you. This stuff um, changes so, so fast. <laughs> yeah. And, and I can, and I can understand that, that Amazon would have wanted to make some money doing this. Um, but so to, just, just to continue, as we're saying, no longer free, you have to pay for it, but the person who's being looked after, so to speak, can also speak to Alexa and call for help through the device. Um, and that notification will come to your cell phone as well. Amazon has purchased the ring company. Um, and is also um, using the ring system for this kind of passive monitoring. The model that I put up on the slide here is a five piece kit that you can buy through the ring system for $200. Um, there's a base station that coordinates the information coming in from all the sensors. There's a keypad, a motion detector, a door sensor, and a Wi Fi extender in this kit. And the idea behind this is that you would sign on to a, so a system called Ring Protect Plus for $10 a month. Um, and in that case, there would be a third party observer tracking the triggering of these sensors and keeping track of behaviors at home. That's as far as I'm gonna go in talking about the different kinds of ways that people can be monitored at home that are on the market. I'm sure that there are others available. But I wanna just, as someone who's used these in the past, and Laura, I'm sure you've thought about this too, um, there are some important ethical and safety considerations to keep in mind. And maybe the most important one is that when a safety alert is triggered, it takes time to respond. Um, as you probably know, a 911 call uh, can get an ambulance to your house within anywhere from 10 minutes to more than an hour. And a question you wanna think about when you're thinking about whether to have a person on site supervising a loved one or someone that you're uh, one of your clients versus having one of these passive monitorings doing that work is how safe are they going to be do you need to have someone there all the time are for they for instance at risk of injuring themselves in the kitchen um, where they need someone to watch them do that kind of thing or are you or are you only concerned that they may forget to take their medicines during the day you want to think through those kinds of considerations before you jump onto one of these passive monitoring ideas. And if you do do that, you want to try it out on a trial and error basis just to make sure that everyone's comfortable with this kind of tracking. Keeping in mind that people's needs and their functional abilities change over time, and you're going to need to reevaluate whether this is the right option or not. Um, we all would love to live independently. We'd all love to be able to make sure that our loved ones are cared for and that we don't have to bother them all the time to do that. Um, so these devices can seem really wonderful and magical. Um, but it's very important for us as professionals to be keeping these other considerations in mind to make sure that what we're recommending and what people are using really is both safe and ethically appropriate for the people that, you, that we're supporting. In, in a larger sense, looking at um, smart home technologies, um, I could talk about this all day and I actually do do that sometimes, but um, I just wanted to throw up a, an inexpensive suite of smart home technologies for an apartment of a person who uses a wheelchair to give us a flavor of what these electronic control devices can do and how relatively inexpensive they really are. On this slide, I put together this suite that I'm going to walk through briefly. Um, this person has an iPhone or an iPad with a home app on it that allows them to control their smart home devices by voice or by tapping the screen. They also have three Philips Hue motion sensors arranged at different places in their home that allow an off-site caregiver to track their movements through the home in the ways that we've discussed. They've got a Honeywell Lyric thermostat, a first alert smoke and carbon monoxide alarm, a ceiling fan that's remote, remote and automatedly controlled, a Nold garage door opener that can be controlled through the phone by voice or, or tap, uh, two lamps controlled by a ConnectSense smart outlet, outlet, and I've thrown in an Apple TV 
that allows all of these devices to be controlled, not just by the phone or the iPad at home, but by a remote caregiver at home or, or when you're going away for vacation um, using your iPhone or your iPad. All of these devices together um, put in place in someone's apartment come to less than $900 in, in cost. And using them means that for under $900, the person can access their home through the garage. A lot of times accessing your home through the garage for someone who uses a wheelchair is the best idea because often there's no extra step to get into the house from the garage. Um, they can control two lights and appliances, auto manage their thermostat and fan. They can voice control their inter entertainment system send broadcasted smoke and carbon monoxide alerts to a loved one and have their home passively monitored. All of these things can be automated uh, based on triggers or scenes and managed while away from home via the Apple TV. This is uh, a lot of functionality, a lot of support um, for a little less than $1,000. You can get fancier. These are some of the front door considerations. Uh, the Ring Video Doorbell for $179 sends a video uh, image to your phone of whoever's at the front door. Um, the Open Sesame Door Opener, which is a very expensive device at $2,200, is nevertheless the gold standard of heavy front door opening devices. The August Smart Lock, which unlocks your and locks your door automatically from your phone switch, costs two hundred and twenty nine dollars. And all of these um, front door devices can be managed through any of your voice assistants as well. It's gotten um, a little ridiculous. Uh, we've learned during the COVID epidemic that there are lots of ways we can use our computers to support our home, our home living situation uh, through transactions and housekeeping, such as automated bill paying, automated grocery ordering and delivery, automated plant watering. There's a robot vacuum cleaner, for instance, like the Roomba shown here that cost about $375. Um, and there is automated pet feeders and even and automated um, I have, a, I have a friend who has an automated device that cleans the cat litter out of her, out of her cat um, litter box. This is, the, this is what we call the Internet of Things. Uh, phone sensors, fitness trackers, baby monitors, automated window blinds, refrigerators that track your food consumption, shopping carts at the grocery store that record and uh, what you're putting in the in the carts and add up the, the number, the amount of money that you're spending as you go. Um, the picture I've shown here is a goofy device called the Eggminder Smart Tray that notifies you by phone when you've run out of eggs for fifteen dollars. Um, all of these, all of these things, uh, are keep in mind. Each one of them is sending information not just to your phone, but sharing it to some kind of server out there on the internet. Um, so what we have to keep in mind, and this is an ethical issue as well, is you're always being tracked. You're always being listened to by your voice assistant, for instance, um, and your clients are going to ask questions around that idea of information security and privacy. What you can do is to seek products that offer end-to-end -end encryption of transmitted data. And for instance, the Apple um, suite of HomePods and other technologies, iPhone, iPads, and all that, they claim to offer that kind of encryption, whereas Amazon devices do not. But the, the, the simple truth is, Anything you share over the inter internet, you cannot be, be sure is secure. If you have a smartphone, everywhere you go with that phone in your pocket is, is information that's being shared over the internet with whatever provider you have. And that, what that information, how that information is being used, we don't know. Keep that in mind as well. This is an ethical problem that goes beyond smart home provision that has to do with our relationships with the, the, inter, the technology companies we, we interact with. But we have to think about it, we have to deal with it, and we have to wonder 
how private our lives really are today. In the world of emerging artificial intelligence, as I said before, our smartphones are tracking and sharing our locations and activities. There are refrigerators that generate orders from the grocery store. Your smart watch can, can track you and encourage more exercise and better sleep. Your voice assistant is observing your behavior and nagging you about taking medications and getting exercise. All of this information may be going back to your doctor's office who's receiving notifications about your diet, your exercise, your medication adherence, your physiological condition, and generating health guidance back to you through your phone. That doctor's office may also be sharing that information with your insurance company, uh, hopefully um, with your permission. All of this is, be, is, be, is um, becoming sort of a growing snowball of shared information for all of us. Um, this idea of artificial intelligence is designed to make us safer and healthier. The, all of this information on this particular slide is available to you today if you want it. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we want it? Because we're getting to very close to an automated nanny situation whether we want a smart home or whether we're not. These are ethical questions. And, and when we're thinking about those ethical questions, a way to break that down for us is to recognize that smart homes are a subset of assistive technology so that any legal or ethical concern around assistive technology also applies to smart homes. Smart homes are also a subset of home modification practice with all of its risks and pitfalls. And added to that, smart homes add the concerns around privacy, information sharing, equity of access, and the learning curve that I've been talking about already. There's a lot there to think about. So these are the, these are the thoughts that I've been thinking about for some time around ethics and smart homes. And before we go into the, combining those two things around the questions we're going to talk about today, let me just ask again, does anyone have questions or thoughts before we move into this next section of our talk? Tony, this is Laura. I'm not yeah. seeing much. Um, Nicole did look up and share that the Alexa together is $19.99 a month. OK. Um, and then I did share just from a AT perspective and a reminder that, and I don't know if you'll mention it, but um, we also always, I haven't shared, but if you have to think about whether or not your um, internet goes down and the yes. impacts in your plan A and B, but I did share with smart locks, they can be fantastic. Um, and you don't have quite this problem in Virginia, but for locations with extremes from heat and, and cold, um, you have to actually look at the, the, the actual lock features because many of our smart locks now no longer have a physical key bypass. And so if the battery goes and there isn't a battery interface, um, you could run into a challenge, especially if you're letting in caregivers or things like that into the home. Yeah. Th thank you so much, Laura, for bringing these kinds of things up. I didn't get into the, the kinds of concerns around home modification practice that you're mentioning when I was right. thinking about this talk, but it's, yeah, of course, when you're thinking about supporting people around home modifications, um, around home safety, one of the most important things to keep in mind is what happens when the power goes out is because let's say you're using an automated pill box with that automated pillbox turns off, the person's not going to be reminded to take their medications anymore. And many people that we support are going to end up in the hospital if that happens. So we have to, you have to think about a, some kind of fail-safe fail support around what happens when those things go into play. And that's just one of the many concerns around home modification uh, supports that we need to keep in mind. So, so th thank you, Laura, for that. Um, some of the ethical issues we're going to be talking about in the next few minutes around smart homes, um, the intrusiveness of monitoring devices and remote controlling things off site, 
this question of privacy regarding information collecting voice assistance. The advanced level of electronic wizardry required to understand and install and operate these things. The rapid obsolescence and expense of smart home tech. The question of robots substituting for human intervention and, re and relationship. When does convenience become necessity? And when does advertising overcome actual need? Finally, are smart home technologies designed with the needs of people with disability in mind? Or are they more about selling things and collecting saleable information for the tech companies? These are all live questions that we could talk about all day, but what I wanna think about today is just keep these things in mind when you're thinking about your own life and, and the, the client services that you're providing because these are questions that are gonna to come to you um, either from your client or in your own mind as you set them up. And all of them have ethical components. There's recently in 2019, there was a really good um, article by Sriram Jenkinson and Peters and BMC Geriatrics Journal that uh, looked, ask uh, 160 caregivers of uh, people with dementia about their thoughts around using assistive technologies to support their loved ones at home. And the idea was to get not the professional's perspective, but the perspective of people who are, who are the caregivers themselves. And these are the things that, that they thought about that feed into what I just said around the ethics of home modification. Any AT that supports safety and security and allows a person to continue living at home was widely supported, even if it compromised privacy and autonomy. AT that was considered to help with social interaction, memory, orientation, and safety proved improved social relationships with caregivers. Um, so they felt that they were having to do less intensive interventions and that allowed them to, to maintain their social relationships rather than their caregiving relationships with their loved ones. AT can improve a sense of competence among, among users and relieve worry and stress for caregivers, especially those who are living off-site. Supportive AT strategies should be discussed early in order to better educate users about its strengths and weaknesses. This has to do with consent, privacy, and security. Caregivers and end users need to be properly educated on how to use and maintain any supportive technology implemented at home. A family-centered model may be better than a person-centered model in this case. Of course, what they're asking for is include the family caregiver in your provision of AT um, at, because they're very likely to be the person who's going to be maintaining it, troubleshooting it, and engaged in using it collaboratively with the loved one living at home. As, as we know, many of us provide supports on the job sites as well, and many work sites are already implementing the kinds of technologies that I, I'm calling smart home accommodations. Um, there are, and all the way back to Henry Ford and the Model T, assembly lines of simplified work tasks. Lots of robots at work nowadays collaborating on work tasks. There are video cameras and clothing-based sensors on many many workers today. They're designed to track productivity, location, and activity, not so much supporting people as tracking them for the, the employer's uh, reasons. Um, tags, screen recorders are also use, being used to track productivity. Many of us have tablets that are used as note takers and database interfaces. And le there's lots of environmental uh, factors that are automated and job sites today, including lights, thermostats, and those kinds of things. So in your interactions with employers, when you're supporting someone with a disability on the job site, uh, you may find that many of the tools that you've been thinking about at home are already being implemented on the job site and, and you, that you can make recommendations to incorporate those um, new th other things that may be not just productivity tracking, but disability enabling for the person that you're working with. <clears throat> so in rehab counseling, you might want to ask, in what situations might a rehab counselor intersect with smart home provision? 
where might ethical dilemmas arise. Um, we're going to look at different examples and discuss those. And then we're going to talk about what issues do you foresee occurring in the future. That's where we want to go in this next, next little while in our talk. Um, one of the things to, that we need to keep in mind when we're talking about any interaction with our clients is our scope of practice. Um, rehab counselors, just like occupational therapists, physical therapists, we all have our different scopes of practice. And it's important that we stay in our lane, um, not, not just for ethical reasons, but for legal reasons. In rehab counseling, under their certification, um, our scope of practice has, has to do with appraisal, diagnosis and treatment planning, referral, case management, program evaluation, research and consultation. And again, that scope of practice is detailed um, in some detail under the certification website linked at the bottom of this slide. Okay. I've been thinking about looking at, at the code of ethics, thinking about where is the most likely place um, a rehab counselor might come into uh, a smart home ethical consideration. And right off the bat, in the very first of the codes, um, there's a very obvious CRC, smart home intersec intersection, that has to do with interventions to remove environmental, employment, and att attitudinal barriers. Um, job analysis, job development, and placement services, including assistance with employment and job accommodations, and provision of consultation about and access to rehabilitation technology. There are lots of places around the Code of Ethics um, for rehab counselors that smart home provision and home modification comes into play. But right off the bat, this is one of the very first that sort of hits you in the face when you're reading down through the code of ethics. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do now um, for all of us to sort of come back to the screen, whatever else you might be doing, and let's, let's work together to think through um, a particular ethical dilemma involving rehab counseling or Professional, um, counsel, professional supports for someone in a smart home environment. And what I'd like us to do is use the chat box to uh, answer the questions that I'm going to be asking. The, so the first, the first question we're going to ask in this situation is, what is the problem? Can you identify the ethical dilemma in one sentence? Here's the case. You are acting as a case manager for a young woman who has a vestibular disorder that causes her to have occasional falls. You have helped her set up a virtual home office for her clerical position at a local company. She lives alone, though her mother is worried that she might fall and injure herself at home. And her mom has heard that passive monitors can be arranged around the home to track her movements. Your client does not want to be tracked like that and calls this helicopter parenting in the extreme. So take a, please take a few moments and on your own paper at, at home, write down as best you can what your dilemma as a healthcare provider may be in negotiating this problem. And once you've done that, go ahead and type that into the chat box. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to think this through. And this is Laura. Please don't yeah. be shy with using the chat box. This is a great uh, ethical dilemma um, with, I feel like, very lots of variables. So curious what everybody thinks. And you, you may, you diff, different ones of you may word it differently. You may see the dilemma differently. And that's an important thing to think about as well. Um, what do you see as the problem here? What is the dilemma as you see it? You don't have to solve it yet. All you have to do is identify it. And this is Laura. What I'm seeing is a comment, unless mom is guardian, she does not legally have a right to request the monitoring. We've got client privacy. Um, 
ultimately you working with the person, um, provide assurance to the mom. The okay. client has a genuine privacy concern. So yeah, everybody's kind of identifying that privacy issue um, and who the client is. Okay, so, so one way to think about describing the problem would have helped if I had said this before, might, might be an, in an either or model. Um, so in this, in this case, if this, if this happens, this, if this happens, that. So again, Laura, can I, can I open the chat to see what they say? Do you think there's a way to, for me to do that? There we go. There we go. Can, can everyone see that on my screen now? No, we're not seeing it on your screen. See, okay. Nope. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to read through them as well. Sure. Yeah, feel free to read through and guide the yeah. kind of steer folks how you're hoping, how you envision them responding. Yeah, so, so thank you for everyone who has responded and um, thought this through. I, I appreciate all the things that you're saying. S some of you are th thinking ahead to a solution already, um, and that's what you want to be doing at the next step. And the very first step of thinking this through, we're just thinking about identifying the problem. And one way, one way that I think all of you are thinking about regarding the problem is... Um, the, the mother is concerned about her daughter being injured and her, and her the daughter is concerned about being about her own personal privacy. So how do we go about assuring the daughter's safety and her privacy? Those are the two concerns that are that are there. That's where the dilemma comes in. Um, on the one hand, we want her to be safe. On the other hand, we want her to have her privacy. So that that on the one hand, on the other hand is a good way to frame ethical dilemmas. Um, and I think you're understanding what you think what you're talking about there. I see other people are posting a few more things. So let's say we let's say that's the decision we've come up with in this situation. On the one hand, mom wants her daughter to be safe. On the other hand, her daughter wants her own personal privacy and she doesn't want to be helicoptered. The next step would be then to go to the stakeholders and have a conversation around this identified problem. So the next question I have for you all is, who are the stakeholders in this case? Obviously, you as a rehab counselor or an OT or a PT or whoever you might be, are one of the stakeholders. Who else is a stakeholder in this case? You go ahead and throw that up when you're ready on the chat box. Who needs to be involved in deciding in, in solving this problem? Okay, some really good answers already have popped up here. Um, we're, we're getting, these, these are the things that I'm reading and not everyone's saying all of these, but they're all included. Um, we're getting the case manager, the client, who would be this, this young woman, her mom, who might also be considered a client, if you're thinking about it from a family-centered perspective, um, and the employer as well, because this is a person who's getting set up to be working from home. Um, and they're asking for, so the question here would be, you would want to coordinate with all of these people an opportunity to get together and discuss this problem and see if you can come up with solutions that satisfy it as best as possible. Right. Excellent. The next step in all of this, and once you is is to identify some of those solutions. So this is a, this is a hard one. What what does anyone can can anyone think of a possible solution that would help both the mom feel safer and the daughter to feel more privacy?
I'm just going to I'm just going to read off what some of people are saying. Don't don't stop typing if you're continuing to think about this as we go. Um, a purse unit, a PERS unit with fall detection, an Apple Watch with fall detection, a smart watch and a risk agreement. These are all ideas that have been, that have popped up so far. Any other ideas? Laura, as long as you're as long as you um, have been switching switching on and off for time, do, do you want to describe um, what your thinking is around using the Apple Watch with fall detection? Sure, this is Laura. Um, I actually had a case very similar to this at one time. It wasn't in home office. It was a uh, mental health counselor, you know, in a traditional office setting um, with uh, fall risk. So for that situation, we ended up doing an Apple Watch with the fall detection so that if she were to get up from her desk and then that is set up with her iPhone to send the SOS um, call to that identified contact within the iPhone. So there are, it's not foolproof, but it is an opportunity to utilize traditional technology that the daughter may be more interested in using um, because it's not something for old people. Mm -hmm. It's an everyday device and it's going to give her Basically, she has the benefit of a smartwatch and everything else it can do. Yeah. And it just happens to maybe fill in this gap related to her disability. Yeah. So, so th thank you. Thank you. I, I, one, of the, one of the nice things about your strategy is that um, you've sort of met the mom and the daughter in the middle. So the mom still knows that she's, she's going to get a notification if her daughter falls and can't get up but she's not going to be tracking her daughter every time she gets up and moves around the house. She's not being helicoptered all the time. Um, and the, the daughter at the same time in the ways you've just described is, is um, feeling like she can get her work done with and maintain her privacy as well. A really nice compromise there. Um, another couple ideas that have popped up, um, an OT evaluation for safe transfers. So bringing that quest, that, situation into into the uh, arrangement to see if it's, we can we make the home safer for this person by teaching them strategies where they're not likely to fall um, an important part to add in as well um, another person has suggested uh, check-in times with the family the friend and the employer so rather than putting putting passive monitors in place putting the responsibility on the client to make calls in, check-in calls, so they feel like they're in control of whatever tracking is going on. So th these are all really good ideas. And what I, what I wanna suggest as the next step in all this is you would then, as a team, problem solve, which of these is, seems like the one that we wanna try first. Um, very often that's the one that's the least expensive. Um, it, might be the, it might be the one that everybody thinks is the, is the easiest to make happen. Um, you all come to an agreement on that. Then you're then following the CRC code of ethics model. You're all supposed to take a deep breath, think it through one more time, and then finally go ahead and implement the solution you've come up with. See if it works, pay close attention, get back together and chat about it again. If it works, great. Check in from time to time to make sure it's still working. You solve that problem and let's move on with life. If it doesn't work, you go back to step one and start all over again. So what you've all just followed in this uh, ethical dilemma just now is the kind of reasoning that we hope all of us will follow in collaboratively problem solving an ethical dilemma. I've got a few more of these on different situations that I want us to think through, all of which are smart home related. So let's move on to another one. So in this situation, three of your clients are residents of a group home for people with mental health disorders. The director of the home wants to install devices that will passively monitor activity, turn off the stove if left on, cue medication adherence, control water use during showers, and limit the use of entertainment appliances. Two of your clients in the home are okay with this, but the third one is adamantly opposed calling this technology an invasion of privacy and personal autonomy. The director comes to you and asks you to talk to this client and bring her around to 
what he calls this new age. So once again, take a moment on your own pen and paper to write down what you see as the problem. So again, you can think of this as in an either or situation if you want to. Um, and then once you're ready and you feel like you're comfortable, go ahead and post that on the chat box. And this is a somewhat different ethical concern than the last one we talked about, obviously. Um, this has to do with what you, something that you're being asked to do that you're probably feeling uncomfortable about. So what you need to think, so you're getting that spidey tingle, um, that, that spidey sense that something's fishy here. You're not feeling comfortable about it. Um, what, are you, what, what is the problem? What are you feeling uncomfortable about? And I'm just reading some of your some of your notes here about this. I'm just I'm going to read a couple of them. The client consent to technology versus being forced to accept it. So so it's 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 that question um, of consent versus coercion that we're that we're thinking about. Even though it is a group home, public home, it is still the resident's right to be there. Controlling water use and limiting the use of entertainment are questionable practices. Other thoughts? And there's the, and one solution has been po suggested. Um, this seems very controlling, and I would probably look at negotiating actual safety needs versus every movement of the residents. So this is this is a so uh, Catherine Scott has jumped into solving the problem for us. Thank you, Catherine. Mary Rodwell is, is suggesting, I would try to suss out why the director wants this level of control over their clients, then advocate on client's behalf because this is questionable. And I guess you're, and I think you're saying ethically questionable. Uh, Nick Gehring is suggesting, what are the group home staff doing if they need all of this technology to monitor residents? Uh, Laura's saying, good point, Nick. Yeah, in this situation, it sounds like we've got a guy who's discovered smart homes and thinks they're the coolest thing ever and feels like it's a way to make life easier for the employee and the employment staff. Okay, so we, we've got a couple of solutions uh, here, in, but I want to go back for a moment and just ask the, uh, the, the no, question number two. Uh, could you could could a few people uh, think through and answer who are the stakeholders involved in this case?
clear, clearly you are the you are the person who has identified this as a problem so that makes you a key stakeholder you have three clients who are have different feelings about living in this group home would you consider all three of them stakeholders under this situation or only the one who is complaining and people and and people are thinking that yes all of them are important to this decision making process clearly the director would be one of the stakeholders as well would you also want to include the um staff in the in the group home Laura is suggesting that there may be guardians involved who may, who may want to be involved as well. So we've got, a, we've got a fairly large group that needs to work through this important question around consent and coercion. And some of you have suggested ideas around that, around solving that problem already. Um, there's no telling how many possible solutions we might come up with. Um, does anybody believe that the right solution may be to just suck it up and bring this client around to what the plan is going to be? I can't imagine that would be the case. <clears throat> okay. Thank you all for, for thinking this one through. You can see how involved this may be. This might be. But it throws, into, it throws into high relief the, the very clear smart home issue around privacy and personal autonomy that is going to be come into play whenever you recommend these kinds of smart home modifications to someone's home. And all the things that, I, that this director wants to do are things that you can do, um, that you can make happen in a smart home. Okay, thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to one more here. And I'll read this out to you. You have some basic electrical skill that allowed you to install a suite of smart home devices in your own apartment so you can control your lights, your door, your entertainment equipment, and your thermostat by voice command using an Apple HomePod or even your iPhone. You have a client who is a wheelchair user and you think they could really benefit from these energy saving enhancements in their home. Unfortunately, there is no AT expert in your area who might be able to install this equipment for them. The client says they would gladly pay you to do the job. So the question here is, can you identify in one sentence what the dilemma is? And again, this is probably one of those situations where your spidey sense is tingling and you're wondering, why am I feeling funny about this question? So I'm, I'm going to read off the, uh, the, the suggested problems that have been posted so far. <clears throat> Rhonda Lechner is saying this could be a conflict of interest. Danette Caslow is saying this is outside your scope, accepting money from a client. Laura is saying being asked to do something which may not be in your role or in your skill set professionally. Julie Reindel, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, says this is an issue of boundaries and liability. Angela Schneider is saying it would be outside the scope of practice. Heidi Lervik is saying accept, find someone else who could do it is the problem. And, and a group of people are saying, are you, there's question, boundary issues, not an electrician. Good point. 
all these all these are uh, very very important considerations around this particular situation. Uh, Cindy Pitchler is saying these devices do not require an AT specialist as they are readily available tech. There are home automation setup services that could be used. So here we have a here we have a suggested solution. Um, is there is there a Home Depot in the area? Is there a Lowe's in the area? Is there some other um, non clinical specialist expert in the area who might be able to put these devices into play for the person? Um, that might the geek the geek squad is being recommended by Laura. I'm going and and I, I'm going to answer this question myself. I guess it seems in this situation the stakeholders are you, the client. Possibly there's someone in this client's family who acts as a caregiver, <clears throat> who may want to be to take part in the problem solving this solution. Um, you may want to go to the code of ethics yourself, or contact someone in the CRC who who is a. Um, specialist around the code of ethics and talk to them around this situation themselves. There's always someone you can talk to around this kind of thing. Um, and you may yourself want to include um, a depart uh, the Home Depot expert in your area as a possible stakeholder who can problem solve this with you. So, all right, I'm going to we, I actually have two more of these. I'm going to do one more and we're going to call it a day. Okay. Thank you for sticking with me on these problems. Uh, problems. Here's one. Of, here's, I'm going to read this one out to you. You are working as a case manager for a young man with intellectual disability who now lives in a group home, but wants to live on his own. The occupational therapist on your team believes that he could live on his own with smart home supports and is offered to implement this AT if funding can be arranged. The young man is excited about this possibility until he realizes that living in a smart home may mean that he will no longer be in close contact with the human support staff he has always relied on. What is the problem? Clearly, this young man uh, wants two different, perhaps incompatible things. So that's the dilemma. So, so in ethical code of ethics terms, this is an autonomy versus isolation problem, right? Who are the stakeholders in this case? Can someone make a list of those? Rhonda Lechner and Angela Schneider are, are suggesting uh, balancing independence with social interaction isolation is the dilemma. The client's fear of social isolation may outweigh the benefits of autonomy. And Andrea Prendota is, is, is listing the case manager, the client, the OT, and possibly a caregiver as the stakeholders involved. Melinda Davis is adding in the support staff at the group home. Catherine Scott is adding, is adding in a funding source. And let, let's move on to, the, to the, the solution part of this question. What's, what possible solutions do you see this uh, group of stakeholders arriving at?
And this, this is a situation that I've run into on several occasions. And we've, the, the solutions that Nick Gehring and Tracy Miller and, hold on, I'm looking, pulling, and Catherine Scott have suggested um, are similar and, and very thoughtful solutions. Um, and that has to do with developing non, developing different kinds of social interactions and opportunities for this young man once he's living on his own. Um, let, me, let me just talk about, briefly about a case that I recently uh, found in my own practice, exactly along these lines. The, the young woman I was working with, once she realized that she was going to have reminders for her medications, she was going to have other kinds of support set up in her home, was no longer going to have a need for the person who'd been visiting her every other day for a year to come to her home to make sure that she was safe at home, that she was taking her meds, that she was managing her finances and doing all those sorts of things that her technology was now gonna help her do. And she said, but I really love that person. I'm, I'm gonna miss them, it's, they're my best friend. The solution that we came up with, which is exactly what all of you are very thoughtfully coming up with as well was, well, let's make sure that this person is still a part of your life maybe in a less with less frequent visits or when they do come let's help let's help them develop out other supports and other relationships with other people that you can have so that you're not relying on them as your only friend in the world um, some of the suggestions that people have put up along those lines are find a day service or some other social activity the client can attend on a regular basis can he be connected to other natural supports in his community so that you'll still have social opportunities and interactions. Also make sure that when developing plan, community integration is included. Have him hooked up with social groups. Maybe the group home he lived in can still have him join them from time to time. These, this, is, this is very thoughtful. These are good ideas. And again, just as one last reminder, the model here would be we've got our stakeholders together. We've come up with solutions to the problem that we think might work. We're all going to decide on the one that we want to try. We're going to double check that that makes sense for all of us and that, that it can be implemented in an economical way. And then we try to implement it and we track to see whether that's working or not. And you can see over time how the, the solution, the decision about whether it's working or not would be whether this young man still feels that he has uh, friends and community supports, even though he is living on his own. Um, so, so that's our plan. Those, those are good solutions for these four situations we've come up with um, this morning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, first of all, thank you all for participating in this way. And I want to wrap up with just a few more thoughts. I'll, I'll skip this last ethical dilemma. You're welcome to think about it on your own when you like. When you're thinking about ethical smart home provision in the ways that we've been talking about this morning, it's important for each of us to educate ourselves about the variety of technologies that are available for living in vocational spaces, because we're going to be asked about that by our clients. You want to see if you can develop a reliable network of professionals and clinicians who can implement these smart home solutions. And again, as we just mentioned, that could be your local Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, investigate funding solutions for smart home tech and advocate for more equi equitable availability of funding. Um, it's, it's all well and good to have lots of this high tech stuff out there, but if the people you're supporting can't afford it for one reason or another, that's an equity problem. And then you want to be able to knowledgeably discuss the strengths and weaknesses and the ethical challenges involved with smart home provision. What I'm hoping is that this morning has helped you at least along solving that particular situation. Ethical smart home considerations in summary have to, uh, I'll just put them out in these in these four ways. Recognize
available over the counter and may be implemented without ethical considerations coming into play. Always attend to the ways AT can lead to social isolation. Always attend to the question of personal privacy and information gathering. Understand that AT providers have an ethical obligation to provide ongoing support as tech and user needs evolve. And that goes back to very to their very first ethical standard, the counseling relationship, which which states in part, collaborate with clients in accommodating to vocational and home site accommodations, respecting their skills, needs, and differences, and sharing your understanding of the ethical concerns involved in using smart home tech. Some ethical smart touch points. The safety risk of relying on technology to substitute for human supervision. That's all, there's also the friendship risk around that. Will technology reduce access to a caring social network? In the consent versus coercion argument, this is always a sticky issue with people who have cognitive or mental health challenges because it can be hard to explain to people why a particular technology may help them. And it can be easy for these people to say yes to something that they don't typically understand. There's been a lot of research around that issue. Does the person understand how to use the technology and what the technology does? Are you as a clinician willing and able to provide ongoing support for the technology? And then what about the stigmatizing element of technology designed for people with disability? In summary, the CRC provides quite thorough ethical guidelines, principles, and standards to guide rehab counseling practice. And that's true for each of us in our different uh, cl clinical professions. Ethical violations may also have legal consequences. Special ethical challenges are involved in smart home provision, including autonomy versus privacy, autonomy versus social isolation, equitable distribution, consent versus coercion, and obligation to provide ongoing AT support. We discussed each of these in the, uh, in the case studies that we just discussed. Ethical dilemmas require informed collaborative problem solving among all stakeholders attending to ethical guidelines and laws. And again, I refer you back to the Code of Ethics, which is posted online and provides a very thorough going um, set of supports and guidelines in helping you sort through these kinds of problems. I wanna thank you for spending time with me this morning. Um, I, there's a fairly rich list of references that I've drawn from in this talk that I welcome, I welcome you to look at yourself posted at the end of this talk. Um, I'm also going to be sending out, um, Laura will be sending to you an article I wrote uh, posted recently in the magazine OT Practice that looks at some of the smart home technologies that are available out there and how they can be used in case in a case study setting uh, in case you want to learn more about this kind of thing. Um, and again, I just want to thank you all for participating this morning and for this opportunity. opportunity. Happy ethical smart homing. Wow, thank you so much, Tony. This is some great information. Um, I loved all the interaction and your case studies. I think it really got folks thinking and processing the information. So thank you everyone for attending today's webinar sponsored by WISPEC. And as I shared at the beginning, you will be getting, there'll be a survey that pops up here at the end, uh, but if you miss it, it'll also be emailed to you tomorrow. And Along with that is information on how to obtain the CRC credits and the CEUs. Um, so since you, if you are a CRC cert, um, certificate, you know the importance of those ethics credits. Um, the link to the materials will be included and this will be recorded and archived on the AT uh, Council, WISTEC AT Council YouTube page. So thanks again for attending and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>